So anyone else? Hey, Malcolm. So many wonderful connections that have been a long time be between. <laughs> Okay, so let's go ahead and begin. I think we're set up. So I want to just welcome everyone and wish everyone a good morning on this Palm Sunday morning. And welcome to this reading of what I've kind of termed the pathwork cosmology. Um, and due to the length of this story, which I'm, you know, condensing four lectures into basically one, um, that we hope we can still have some interactive moments, certainly afterwards, if people want to stay over, I'm welcome to do that. And also feel free to post in the chat. I don't, I know not a lot of us are real familiar with, welcome to do that. Um, and then I just want to say an introduction a little bit that, uh, you know, this is a, what I consider a sacred story. And these sacred stories touch us on a deeper level than just the informative historical level. Um, you know, they are at once historical and timeless. And they're teaching stories or allegories illustrating our present moment in mythical time. So the teachings are multi-leveled. And they're unable to really be conveyed in anything less than this whole story. Uh, it's a big story, especially in a cosmology of how we came to be and what our purpose is. Um, and so the Pathwork has this wonderful cosmology about, uh, it starts out really in the lecture on free will and how, you know, like the purpose of that. And then all through, you know, it's like it, it kind of brings that theme through. And so it, it begins, you know, with God, the creation, and then the fall of the angels. Well, Jesus Christ is also the very first one in there. Um, and, and then the plan of salvation. And so it, it ties together to me very deeply this kind of time. And I think I said, you know, it, it helps me hold a space for this celebration or this, you know, commemoration that we have of this time here on earth. Um, and I just want to invite, you know, people to listen with their hearts as well. So um, I find it a great context with some unique understandings for a contemplation of Easter. And I reread it every year at this time. So let's begin. God the creation, original blessing. 
So it starts out really asking this question, who is Christ? Which I find is an interesting thing since here we are at this time, you know, making a big deal out of this being. So some Christian religions. Sorry to interrupt. But sure. Were you, were you intending to share a text screen or not? Not right now, I don't think. Uh, do you do you need to have it come up? I'm sorry. No, I don't need it. I was just curious. I thought maybe you had forgotten to share a text screen. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, I didn't even know about that. I just thought people could naturally text and whether we would see it would depend on our own. So I don't know if I have to share it or not. So no, you I got mean, me on that your, one. what you are reading, sharing what you are reading. Oh, oh, got you. So I had asked, um, run that by Dan earlier, and he felt like it would be better to keep you know, people able to see each other, but okay. I am totally open to share the screen if people prefer that. And I know because you are in my lecture study, we usually okay. do. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, why personally, I uh, personally, I like being able to see faces, just that's, that's my perspective, but, you know, others may feel different. <laughs> yeah, I think that there are kind of two different levels of this. So um, this, this, uh, I can send people links of the text and I can also, um, it will be recorded. So that won't, you know, probably be just a s screen uh, with the people in the verbal. But I think let's go ahead and go this way. Just close your eyes and listen. Listen to it as a story being told. And if you want to look around and see who else is here with you and that kind of thing, occasionally that would be great. Okay. So who is Christ? Some Christian religions claim Christ is God. Some say Jesus was just a wise man, a sage, a great teacher with great wisdom, not unlike a few others who have lived at other times in other countries. The truth is, my friend, whether you want to believe it or not, Jesus, the man, was the incarnation of the Christ. And this Christ spirit is the highest and most exalted of all created beings. He, and here we are in, in you know this new time where you know sometimes the gender issues are questionable, and I think Christ is where you know it would be a, a, a both genders. You know what, how we can speak of that, I don't know. So I'll just keep it in the he. But I want people to you know realize that as a spirit, this is both masculine and feminine. So. This being is the first directed and inborn creation of God. God's substance, Christ's substance, is the same as the substance of God. All of you possess some of this substance, which I call the higher self or the divine spark. It has come out gradually. It has to come out gradually through spiritual development. But no other created being has this substance in quite the same degree as the Christ. So in one other place, I think he says, you know, we were all created from the Christ. God put forth as his first creation the spirit of Christ. And the man Jesus was the incarnation of that being on earth in history. But long before Jesus, in the beginning was the word the Christ consciousness, the firstborn from which all other creatures came into existence. So many that you could not count them with the numbers you have available in your world. Once I was asked, why did God create these beings? Being all knowing, God must have realized that misery could result from it. This is indeed an important question which I would now like to touch on briefly. God is love, and love must share. This is the nature of love. Of course God realized that because God created beings with free will, they could so decide with this free will what misery could come into existence, either permanently or temporarily. Nevertheless, as an indication of greatness, God created beings who could choose freely with the power given them. They either would have the wisdom 
of not abusing their power and thus living within the perfection of divine law in a state of eternal bliss. Or if they decided otherwise, they would finally come to comprehend all the more the perfection of divine law after having gone through the valley of death. Thus, they would be more godlike than ever before. The temporary misery for those who might decide wrongly is nothing compared to the bliss and happiness of eternity after the self-inflicted misery has been experienced. Thus, God created many beings and many worlds long before a material world existed. Worlds of harmony, happiness, infinite beauty, and infinite possibilities, which unfolded creative divine aspects for all beings. Here, the divine substance of each created being was freely active and not covered by foreign and ungodlike matter. I have often said that it is your task to uncover this divine substance within you and to free it of these God-opposed layers which rob you of your unity with yourself and with God. This divine substance is also referred to as a human being's higher self or divine spark. It is also referred to at times as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not one being, nor is it a part of a threefold God in the sense it is often interpreted. It is simply the divine substance that every living creature possesses to some degree, whether freed to some extent of other substances or still covered up by them. The divine spark within you is godlike. Only this purified and freed substance within you is capable of uniting with God and therefore of being one with God. No substance that is unlike God can unite with him. And I want to highlight that just as I have, you know, it's, it's like this is important that we cannot unite with God unless we are in the same vibration as God. So people often advance the idea that God should not have endowed his creatures with free will, for then the fall could never have happened. Or they claim God at least should have interfered when the fall started. However, this view is short-sighted and blind. Happiness can only exist for any created being through union with God. And to be in union with God, you must be of the same substance and endowed with the same aspects and qualities. Otherwise, you would be unlike God and thus incapable of being in union with him. Free will and free choice entails the possibility of directing free will contrary to divine law. In choosing freely and correctly, and in abstaining from abuse of power, lies divinity, love, wisdom, and a number of further divine attributes. God has also put into creation an infinite number of laws. These laws provided beforehand for the possibility of a return to God if any of the created beings should misuse their power and freedom given to them by God. These laws work in cycles which have to close. Whatever happens, the laws work in such a way that ultimately everything having once turned away from God and divine law will eventually come back. The greater the distance from God, the more misery, for only in God and with God lies happiness. So spiritual worlds did exist for a very long time where all created beings lived in a state of bliss in a way that is unimaginable. The possibility existed since they came into existence to choose freely, either to live within divine law or to act against it. At one time, one spirit fell under the temptation to act against it. Perhaps you are able to comprehend some of this when you imagine what it is like to possess great power. You may know that to use this power in a certain way might prove to be dangerous for you. 
Yet as long as this power is not exploited, you feel a curiosity about what actually would happen if you did use it. The temptation becomes stronger and stronger. You don't mean to continue to use this dangerous power, but you feel you must try it out just once to see. I infer from this story that the first temptation, the first thought that brought us down through the the thought that the justice of God was not just. And I think the guide says this somewhere in, in there, but there's this, you know, understanding that like the fall, there was a, a certain thought that ran counter to this uh, divine flow. And so that was this concern or this fear or this, you know, separation in whatever slight way, because there was some sense that the justice of God was not really truly just. So I want you to take that in in a minute and just kind of, you know, notice how many times does that fall happen for you, you know, when we go into this understanding of, you know, ah, something's not fair, you know, when, when we feel like life is difficult or not fair in some way, you know, that's, I think, a part of this thought form. So back to the story. Once the first spirit succumbed to the temptation, it set something in motion that could not be changed anymore. This spirit once knew that this would be so, but did not wish to remember after he had succumbed. The result was not an immediate change, but a gradual one. The change from harmony to disharmony took place just as gradually and as slowly as your personal growth occurs from disharmony to harmony. The later is evolution, the former could be called a devolution, and neither can happen suddenly. This spirit, this one spirit who succumbed first generated a power running in the opposite direction to divine law. But it was still the same power, only used differently. With this power, the spirit could affect and influence many other spirits, little by little. But not all spirits were affected. There was a division between those who succumbed and those who did not. With the former, the fall of the angels began. In Lecture 19 on Jesus Christ, the guide explains that the first thought that generated this new direction and misuse of power, the first thought that caused many other creatures to fall as well, was a thought that questioned God, that questioned if God's justice was just. Was God fair? This happened because of a perceived favoritism and envy that Lucifer developed over Christ. So if the questioning and lack of faith is, you know, the questioning of God is the source of the fall, like I said, in this process, every divine aspect turned into its opposite nature. Harmony turned to disharmony, beauty to ugliness, light to darkness, wisdom to blindness, love to hatred, fear or egotism, and union became separateness. Then wholeness split even further, the more this pull of temptation proceeded. Thus evil came into existence, but we must question. We are determining beings and co-creators. And so by that, by very our na very nature, there's a sort of contrary current with us, right? And so again, you know, this is this kind of understanding that the fall while it was real and serious, also was not something that, you know, necessarily should be avoided. It's part of our journey, our descent, and our initiation. So once I explained that the spiritual worlds are psychological worlds, which does not mean that they are unsubstantial and formless, only in your material world are thoughts and feelings abstract. In other words, worlds, spirits create their own worlds 
wherein they live according to their states of mind. Each state of mind creates as a reflexive action, a sphere consisting of landscapes, inner and outer conditions, and so on. When you keep in mind that your attributes, your thoughts, your feelings, your opinions, and your goals create your world, you will understand that the world of the highest spirits is beautiful and light, while the world of the fallen spirits has become dark and ugly. Since the great plan was put in operation, many in between worlds came to exist in various degrees of harmony and disharmony, according to the state of development which the once fallen spirits had reached. Your material world is one of these in-between worlds. The disharmonious worlds which came into existence through the separation from God are also called hell. These worlds simply reflect the state of mind of the creatures living there. These spheres came into existence as a direct result of the state of mind of these beings. But hell is not just one sphere. There are many spheres there, just as there are many spheres in the divine world, or so-called heaven. When the fall took place, not all who participated came into an equal state of disharmony and evil. The degree was very individual and different. Thus, different spheres came into being within the world of darkness, always corresponding to the individual state of mind. As long as complete purification has not been achieved, some of the characteristics of the fall are still going on within a person to some degree. It would be extremely useful for each one of you to delve into your soul and clearly come to feel this process, thus making it conscious. When you consider your individual faults, try to find the original divine aspect of them. For no fault could come into existence by itself. It is only a distortion of something that was once divine. You can find this divine aspect in all your faults. Then it will be so much easier to purify your faults and at the same time lose your sense of hopelessness and inferiority about yourself. Since one of the most important divine aspects is free will or freedom of choice, this had to turn into its opposite too. The spirit who was the first to succumb to the temptation of abusing this power, the one who is sometimes referred to as Lucifer, Satan, or the devil, who influenced others to follow him, was the first one to inhabit the new world that came into existence. This spirit had complete power over all those who followed him. And contrary to God, he used this power. God gives the freedom of choice, and this has deeper significance than most of you realize. With that freedom comes the possibility to abuse the given power and to use it contrary to divine laws. If no choice were available, there would be no freedom and no power. There can be no divine happiness, in fact, no divinity at all, if it cannot be attained or maintained by free choice. By the same token, the opposite of God and his laws must be the prohibition of free choice and the domination of the stronger over the weaker ones. So we see this around us in the world, but again, that's a projection of our inner states. So you might take a moment and you know see if there's some aspect of you that wants to control you, that doesn't like that you have free will and that you don't do exactly what it wants. I think just as we embody Christ consciousness, we also embody this Luciferic consciousness. And it's very useful to see and own, you know, and then align with this beautiful truth and blessing of free will. This state of affairs 
would seem to make the salvation of the fallen beings impossible for this is this you know domination right for even should they have come to the point of desiring to go back to god they would not have had the power to do so since they were under the dominion and power of the one who reigns in the world of hmm. on the other hand without breaking his own laws how could god save those beings who longed for him if god were to use its infinite power by overruling the free will and the choice of those who decided to use the given power in their own way god would actually be acting from the same principle as lucifer here more than in anything else maintaining the divine principle was of the utmost importance for only if god remained true to his divine nature and the divine laws would there be a fundamental difference between the ways of god and the ways of lucifer mm -hmm. since it is god's plan that every creature should recognize god and at one time come back to god out of free choice and reattain divinity it was imperative the god not use the same means of force as god's opponent even though god's purpose might be a good one it is not the end alone that counts but very much the means too only by remaining true to these principles would the most stubborn of the fallen beings one day see the vast difference between these two ways of being and understand the dignity that lies in the divine principles even though it requires a path of humility acceptance of suffering for those who wish to get out of the self-created negative circumstances since life in spirit is in direct relationship to the inner harmony enlightenment and general attitude spirits who have become disharmonious cannot be simply put into a world of harmony as you might travel into a beautiful country in the world of spirit the country is both you and your product therefore the once fallen spirits had and still have to attain a state where again they naturally produce harmonious worlds you will readily understand now that this must happen in free choice too so that questions like why has god not done away with evil need not come up any more in your deliberations on the other hand means had to be found so that the creatures who desired to return to god and to keep his laws instead of lucifer's could do so within the framework of the laws of god thus the free will of no one would be broken not even of lucifer himself this is a great plan of salvation in which christ played a major role but first in the aftermath of the fall the spheres of darkness first came into existence where the spirits lived under the dominion of lucifer in the beginning there was no longing for or sense of the light they had once possessed only after tasting the self-chosen medicine for a considerable time that is experiencing a state of desolation did a vague longing for something else they did not quite know what take hold of some of these beings the vague longing that first some and later more creatures felt was sufficient to bring a glimmer of light into their world as though a far away dawn change the contours of their world a little bit when enough spirits came into this state of longing and the longing increased the time was ripe for the physical earth as you know it to come into existence you may say that god created the material world and this is true for nothing can be created without the creative divine force however it is truly equally true that the material world was also created by the longing of each of the spirits for something higher the world in which you are now living is the product of the desire to strive higher 
here conditions exist in which spiritual development can proceed and in which a free choice for God can be made, which is impossible in the worlds of darkness. In other words, this earth sphere is a product of the longing of the fallen spirits, and it is equally a product of the longing of all those beings who remained with God and whose deepest desire was always and is always to bring their brothers and sisters back to God. Therefore, both the divine worlds and the worlds of darkness helped in the creation of this earth sphere. The influence of both worlds exists and will manifest itself according to the attitude of each individual being on this plane, possessing the power of free choice. On earth, where the influence of God's world also existed for the first time since the fall, they now had the opportunity to learn, to change, to turn to God, and thus to create a better world for themselves in both matter and spirit. They would go to the spirit world after the death of the body and also during sleep when the body rested. From the spirit world, they would receive inspiration and influences of all sorts. If God's world had not acted on this earth too, there would not have been any difference between the earth sphere and a sphere in the world of darkness. How did the influence of the world of God manifest itself? This would seem to be an impossibility since according to universal law, an individual being has to make the first step in order to receive help from the world of God. How could this step be made if the whole entity was still so coarse that it had no inkling of God, no idea of this world, and no notion of what to do? The answer is that pure spirits who remained in the divine worlds were incarnated at all times. To be sure, very few were incarnated at one time. But the influence of one such being outweighs by far the strength and influence of a hundred creatures of the world of darkness. The spirits who were incarnated from the world of God brought with them light, love, and wisdom. They fulfilled a great mission with their incarnation on earth and their influence was much more far-reaching than might have appeared in first sight. With this influence growing steadily through the ages, the fallen spirits during their incarnation on earth could freely choose what side to listen to, the side that reached their lower nature or the side that seemed to push them ever upward, regardless of the difficulties encountered. By such free choice, God's law concerning the aspect of life this aspect of life was not violated. Gradually, more of the once fallen spirits came into the state where they could recognize God. Their longing became conscious and meaningful. Their will could now be developed to overcome the evil impulses of their lower nature. The change that began to take place had a much greater effect than can be easily realized. Not one of you fully understand that if a single person develops really well, doing the best in his or her power, this person does not only help him or herself, but adds the most valuable cosmic power to a great reservoir. People will not know as long as they are on earth how far reaching the effect of the smallest endeavor in this direction is. salvation. On the earth's sphere, you have the possibility with your free will to develop and to decide which side to follow. In your own nature, you can, of course, find both currents, the good current that once came from God in perfection, and the evil current that was accumulated during and after the fall. Between these two currents, the conscious self stands, able to decide either to take the line of least resistance, which is always man's lower nature, or to follow his higher self, which is the difficult and narrow path. Many people believe that Christ died on the cross for the sins of everyone else, and as a result, no one is responsible or accountable for their sins, faults, and weaknesses, 
for Christ has atoned for them through his death. This, of course, my friends, cannot be so. It would be utterly senseless. God's plan was ultimately that every single one of these fallen beings should have the means to come back to God, back to the light and harmony. But it was essential that God's laws never be broken, not even for the purpose of bringing back the fallen creatures. So all the while creation was unfolding, Christ was busy preparing and working in the spirit world of God, planning ahead, sending various pure spirits to live on earth. He, Christ also organized teachings for the pure spirits now incarnate to bring to mankind, either through inspiration and guidance or through communication with God's world. At that time, no matter how far human beings developed spiritually, when returning to the beyond, they were still under the dominion of Lucifer. As I explained, every divine aspect was turned into its opposite quality. Therefore, free will, which is divine, was turned into domination. And Lucifer would not give up the dominion he held over his followers. If, for instance, a human being, due to a changing attitude and growing harmony with God, began to produce light and beautiful spheres in the spirit world, even these spheres still belonged to the kingdom of Lucifer because he did not relinquish his power over this person. Furthermore, no one was at that time far enough developed to produce only spheres of light. People would produce and own several spheres, harmonious and disharmonious ones. I have also mentioned that salvation was not only accomplished on this earth sphere, but in every sphere of existence. <clears throat> this happens, incidentally, with each one of you and with every human being. Wherever there are faults, weaknesses, and blindness, corresponding spheres come into existence. Wherever you are pure and purified, you create beautiful spheres. And you will not only own the best, but also the worst of what you have built. Oops, I lost my place. Let's see. Ah. When enough beings were ready and cognizant of God and consciously desired to have complete union with God, the time was ripe for the most important part of the plan of salvation to take place, which Christ took upon himself. So a little background, just during the process of the fall, the first spirit who fell, Lucifer, developed an intense jealousy of Christ, and this created an adversarial stance toward Christ from Lucifer. So in a way, I see, you know, self-will versus divine love, which is what will bring true happiness. So God made Christ, or love, the king of the universe. And as such, Christ possessed not only the highest privileges, but also the strongest responsibilities. By carrying the heaviest burden alongside his exalted position, he gave another example for the world to follow. Thus, it was logical that Christ should prove Christ's love by Christ's great sacrifice and work, not only to all the other fallen creatures, but also to Lucifer himself, who through Christ's deed alone would one day in the future find it possible to return to God and thus find ultimate happiness. Thus, when the time was ripe, Christ faced Lucifer. Quote, Christ said, now, there are so and so many spirits who do not want to wish to remain faithful to you. They desire to go back to God. Therefore, you should set them free. Lucifer would not agree to that. He maintained that he did not recognize divine law and would use his power as he saw fit. So Christ said, in that case, there must be a contest or a battle between us, between your forces and the forces of the divine world. Lucifer said, if such a battle took place, and if the divine forces won and took my power away, 
I would not recognize the law of God as being just. As you know from my previous lectures, I'm hitting these things wrong. Mm -hmm. As you know from my previous lectures, this issue constituted an essential part of the plan of salvation. Since no one should be eternally damned, not even Lucifer himself, and so that no eternal damnation would ever be possible, Lucifer himself would have to admit at all times the absolute justice of the divine laws. Therefore, Christ asked him, in what way would you consider the divine powers to be just? And Lucifer answered, I would consider this battle fair if one being from the world of God would live on earth like a man without any protection or guidance from God's world at crucial times, with a great part of his knowledge dimmed out and matter standing in the way, and yet remain faithful to God in spite of my temptations and in spite of the most difficult conditions possible. For I would offer this person every worldly power and release from all hardship if he forsook God. If he remains faithful to God under such conditions, which I doubt very much, in fact, I say it is impossible, then I will have my battle with you. And if you win, I will recognize God's laws as being utterly just. So if any being from the world of God can remain true to God's laws and spirit under the most difficult of material conditions, in spite of physical hardship and temptation for escape through temporary comfort, then I will have such a bad you know, in, in so many ways, this is, you know, our, our own true states. And so in that way, again, we can all be seen as, you know, Christ incarnate here undergoing this same journey to become, to remain faithful and to hone ourselves into that place through our work, through our longing, through our prayer, through our deepest intentions. So you must know, my friends, that every living being has at all times guardian spirits from the world of God. Some people's attitudes may keep these spirits from coming too close. Nevertheless, they are there, even if only in the background, watching that nothing befall their protege that is not according to God's laws of justice, or that the person may be too weak to endure be left alone without the support of God's spirit world on this earth sphere, and in addition, having to resist all attacks, challenges, hardships, and temptations that the powers of darkness could think of seemed an indeed impossible task to fulfill. No human being had ever had to go through anything remotely like it. Therefore, the Christ cannot be compared with any other person who has ever lived, no matter how pure, how wonderful the teachings may have been. Christ has shown indeed and in fact what others have taught, and he did it under infinitely more difficult circumstances than anyone else ever had to bear. So we are both like, but so far, you know, below in some sense, you know, this great being but this is where that then journey that he took on was so important to all of us. So these were the conditions Lucifer set up for him to recognize God's laws as being just. If this seemingly impossible task were really to be fulfilled, then the battle could take place. So this is just like preceding the battle, right? Should Lucifer lose the battle, then Christ could make his terms, and Lucifer would not doubt God's justice. Thus was the plan, and Christ took it upon himself 
for the above reasons, though Lucifer did not specify that it had to be him. My friends, if you study all the scriptures from this point of view, you will get an entirely different understanding of them. I am quite sure that the reason for the life and death of Christ will now make sense to you. There would not be any sense in Christ dying on the cross for sins others have committed. If you have committed a sin, you yourself have to straighten it out, and no one else can or should do it for you. If someone else were to do it for you, you would not gain purification. You will also understand why Christ was left completely alone for a long time. Naturally, as a man, he did not have the same knowledge he had as a spirit. If he had had that same knowledge, the task would not have been so difficult. He did, of course, possess some knowledge since he is the highest being in creation. In addition, he had a great deal of spiritual strength and wisdom. However, there would be no purpose to life on earth at all, and this applies to everyone, if the same spiritual knowledge were available in the flesh as when one is not incarnated. So Christ did not know exactly what was involved while he lived on earth. In the course of the years, he received some knowledge. He had a vague idea, just as any one of you might have a vague idea of the task Christ was to fulfill. What may come of it, how it will end, what the exact meaning is, you will not know. He did not know that either. This is Jesus at this time, now a man incarnate. And he was not supposed to know it while incarnated. After a certain time, all the angels of God had to leave him. They were with him for some time of his life, but were not present when the really difficult task began. The task was, as I explained, that he, left quite alone and cut off completely from the world of God, had to resist the temptations of Lucifer, who put the greatest effort imaginable into this goal to cause Christ to fall. He used every device possible, and in so dealing, he organized all his helpers. On the one side, Christ experienced nothing but suffering, both physical and psychological, as well as humiliation, the extent of which you cannot imagine. The humiliation and psychological suffering were a great deal worse than the physical suffering, as bad as that was. On the other side, he was offered all the temptations of the world of darkness. Then, on top of that, Christ was what you would call psychic to the maximum degree. His mediumistic qualities were so strongly developed, not just in one respect, but in every respect, that they were greater than anyone else's before or after. This was an advantage as long as God's world was close to him. But when he was cut off from it, this was merely an additional hardship for all the manifestations coming to him originated from the world of darkness. Clairvoyantly, he came in contact first with high emissaries from the Luciferic world and later with Lucifer himself, who made himself appear as a beautiful being offering Christ all the worldly advantages he might desire and instant release from all his sufferings if he accepted Lucifer and gave up his idea of God. Lucifer taunted him in the worst moments of his suffering. Where is your God of love and justice? If he existed, would he allow his beloved son to go through all of this? If your God cannot offer you more, are you not better off with me? Look what I have to offer you. God can only offer you intense suffering and hardship in every possible respect. Your God can only offer intense suffering and hardship. So can you imagine what this meant? If Jesus had known in the, in the exact significance of his task, it would not have been half as difficult to resist. <laughs> oh. Although I would still say difficult. 
But this was precisely the point, to have doubts at these crucial times, doubts about everything, about his true identity, about his being, about there being any wise and good purpose in undergoing all the hardships which he could not understand at the time. In short, about everything he had learned in the previous years, that was inevitable. Often he wondered whether he was not under some illusion and whether all his previous knowledge was not the product of imagination. During these times of doubt, Lucifer would instantly be at his side and strengthen such thoughts. It is easy to perceive how extremely hard it must have been for him. Being a man, having matter between him and absolute truth, to remain faithful to God and not to give in to these temptations aggravated by hardships. If the conditions of his task had not been such that even Christ might have doubted at times, his task would not have been so infinitely magnificent. Therefore, Christ had to have the same obstacles of matter as all other human beings, but his were intensified to a maximum degree. Material substance is a curtain, and man has to grope to open that curtain. Jesus Christ had to do the same, but in conditions of which you can only vaguely appreciate the extreme difficulty, even with these explanations. To remain on the right path under these circumstances, without fully understanding it, my friends, you cannot really know what it meant. And having the humility, in spite of all the passing thoughts of doubt, to put God above everything, above his suffering, above his not understanding why. That was the task. It indeed seemed almost impossible that anyone could do it. But Jesus Christ did. By doing this, Christ not only fulfilled the conditions by which the world of darkness could never at any time claim God's laws to be unjust, but at the same time, he set an example for everyone born after him. So when you are in suffering and you do not understand why, think of Jesus Christ within the setting of the true story of salvation. Immediately after Christ had successfully completed his task on the earth's sphere, a number of so-called miracles took place on earth showing mankind that a major phase in the history of creation was over and an important new phase was to begin. After Christ's physical death, he returned to the world of spirit, having fulfilled the conditions with a relatively small number of specialized spirits. He fought a spiritual battle in the world of darkness. That spirits should have wars, my friends, may sound again too human for you, but where do you think your wars come from? They are only an outpicturing of spiritual war. I can only describe it in a somewhat condensed way that may sound symbolic and may be symbolic to a certain extent. So a war took place between Christ and Lucifer. Again, Lucifer had to admit the justice of the ways of God's world. For as mentioned before, Christ came to fight under equal conditions. It would have been in his power not to take any risks by using greater strength and more helpers. However, he did this, he did not, and this was for the same reason that he undertook life on earth for God's justice to be preserved, even in the eyes of Lucifer. The chances were even, and this was so apparent that not even Lucifer could deny it. That was important. For the plan was and is that Lucifer himself must ultimately come to the point where he too will return to God as the very last of all the fallen creatures, since he was the first to return away from the laws of God. Jesus Christ fulfilled the plan of salvation in every sphere. His task varied in each of the numerous spheres because each was different. In the world of God, where the manifold preparations were made on the earth sphere and in the world of darkness, after the battle was over, new conditions were set up, and they have reigned ever since. 
The new conditions meant that all human beings were given the opportunity to turn to God during their development on earth, going from one life to the other. Lucifer kept all the rights to tempt humans to succumb to him by succumbing to their own lower nature. Should they resist, they would no longer be subjects of the Luciferic world, for the doors were now open to unite with their creator and inhabit the divine worlds once more. Even the traps and temptations that Lucifer could use were from that time on limited. In accordance with divine law, God's spirit world now has the right to interfere. The divine laws must be observed in exactitude. The activities of the powers of darkness are limited and must stand ultimately under the jurisdiction of God. I like to remember this myself sometimes in my prayers for our world as it is now. For Lucifer to still possess a certain amount of freedom is necessary not only for the now so often explained reasons that he must always recognize divine justice, but also as a necessary means for development. Evil has to be tasted to the brim in many cases before it can be overcome by free will and the being's own initiative. The desire to overcome must grow through ever mounting enlightenment in each individual's soul. And this often is only possible after one has gone through darkness. That such enlightenment cannot come in one lifetime goes without saying. To accomplish the perfection that is needed to enter into the kingdom of God, the perfection that was lost through the fall, and to shed all the darkness that has come upon a soul can never be done in one lifetime. Many, many lives or incarnations are indeed necessary. Life on earth is like a school where you develop from one class to the other. Sometimes you may stay for a while in one class and then you may have one or several incarnations in succession where you accomplish a great deal. You see, it cannot be any other way for it would be impossible to reach in one lifetime the necessary perfection needed to enter the kingdom of God for always. With each life, even in the worst cases, something is gained, even if the benefits can only be fully experienced at a later period. The outer personality, with its willpower and capability to decide one way or another, has the means one day to make the decisive step. I declare myself for God, for my higher self, with everything that it entails, disregarding the laziness, the comfort, the way of least resistance to give in to one's faults. Whether the faults are still murder, stealing, wickedness, or are now only selfishness, jealousy, envy, resentment, laziness, or whatever else, makes no difference in principle. Anyone truly declaring and deciding and remaining with the decision to follow the path of God, hence the salvation of Christ, cannot remain a subject of the Luciferic world. Lucifer will have no power over such a being, whether on earth or in the spirit world. This is the way Christ has opened the door. You may now understand why it is said that Christ saved you from your sins. This is accurate only in the sense that your great sin of falling, of not remaining faithful to God and of becoming at one time part of the world of darkness does not have as a consequence eternal exclusion from the divine worlds. From this Christ has indeed saved you, and for this you certainly have all the reason in the world to be grateful to him. Through him you now have the possibility by your own efforts and development to cross the threshold. In that sense, it is correct to say that Christ died for your sins. However, the interpretation that Christ died for all your sins and all your faults is very wrong. So this then, very briefly, is the story of the creation of the universe, the fall, the creation of the earth's sphere, and the salvation through Jesus Christ. Be blessed, my dear ones. Be in God. Be in Christ.
So welcome back. <laughs> and it looks like it's 12. So I think this is a time that, you know, people sometimes stay over for, you know, a kind of coffee and hangout, but we could um, continue if people want. So if anybody needs to leave now, that's fine. And this will um, be recorded. I don't know, should we, re I guess we should continue to record the discussion if we have one. So people be aware we're still recording. Um, so any comments, any reactions? And I think I really got this time how um, pivotal the role was, uh, you know, Jesus' role in the plan for salvation. And I certainly am one who has totally appreciated the need for absolute freedom of choice. And, um, uh, and it's also so daunting how long the mythical time goes on that uh, it's almost like, <laughs> it's a wonder we make it in a way, except for um, the fact that God's spirits can be closer. And yeah, very grateful. Thank you. Beautiful. I think I, you know, agree in the sense that I often, you know, see much more clearly how completely tangled up and split like we're like a marble that was in the oven and then put in ice or something <laughs> we just fractured right you know and and the, to unify in in this way you know with that free will it is a a task for sure that we are all doing and and yet i do also see now much more clearly how there is you know sort of this divine support all the way through even the temptations, the challenges, the crucifixions, right, are really, and mine are, of course, not anything near what Jesus went through, but, you know, we have ours. And so, it, but it is a part of God's helping us to develop and grow. And again, sometimes we don't see it in the moment and only recognize it later, but I find it useful to always sort of see, even in the challenges, the trials, the temptations, you know, like, you know, where is God in all of that? Because God is definitely there. This month's GPS uh, is talking about the, the self-responsibility and the abyss of illusion. And personally for me, my struggle has always been self-responsibility i've always been of course subconsciously looking for uh, a benign god to take care of me and you know just take my responsibility all i have to do is be as good as i could be and god will take care of me so this idea of self-responsibility is really hitting home in terms of my choices and how i show up and what I'm responsible for, even my self-worth, like at a really deep level, am I coming to acknowledge that this free will is really something that I haven't particularly used well this life and now can choose something else. So this is a perfect lecture. Thank you, Darlene. Beautiful. I can comment after everybody, so I'm going to try to keep my mouth shut and let more people speak. <laughs> well, this is Bill. I wanted to just reflect that uh, I've been experiencing a kind of cycle of um, death and reincarnation with uh, with Seven Oaks. So I've been involved in the process that's, um, God willing, going to come to fruition this week where Seven Oaks ownership will pass to a new uh, organization. And um, I don't know, the last four, five years or more, I've just seen a lot of uh, struggle. 
I, I won't go into any of the story about it, but just seen a lot of darkness and light kind of at war in some way um, about this land and this community. And, uh, and it's just really, um, it's not insignificant to me that this transaction is coming to its conclusion in what Christians call Holy Week. Um, so to, to hear the guide talk about Christ and Lucifer in pretty biblical terms, it's like, okay, there's some there's some truth there. Um, I don't know how to quite express it, but um, it's it's not just to me. It's not just uh, well, you know, you do what you can in this life, and then the next life is whatever. Like, no, incarnation happens many times in one physical lifetime. I've seen the pictures of Seven Oaks when it was a clapped out farm with a falling down farmhouse and some buildings that were barely still there. And Susan and Donovan turned it into this amazing retreat center. And then, you know, 50 years went by and um, now it's going to another owner. Um, so, um, so there's something really um, inspiring about that cycle. Um, uh, and, and again, it, it you know it it can be measured in different time <laughs> time spheres. It just it feels like it's really helpful learning to have lived long enough to see <laughs> some of these cycles. And I'll just add, uh, those of you who follow Susan Pazenga on Facebook will notice a post she put up in the last day or so, in which a uh, a bleeding heart is blooming. Um, uh, on Donovan's gravesite, like what? <laughs> I mean, um, you know, I I read some symbolism into that. So, uh, uh, and I, even though I've moved away from um, traditional Christian practice, every every year about this time, I just look out the window and I see this green mysteriously coming out of nowhere, and I go. Okay, this is the life everlasting. That's all I need. I'm good. <laughs> so anyway, good time of year to do this. Uh, thanks, Darlene, for reciting the story. And hopefully each of us can take our own little kernels from it. Absolutely. And th yeah, you know, it's like I, my sense is that that Christ is in everything and all of nature. And so it is you know, represented all around us in, in, in spring, I agree. It's like, it's the perfect expression of that resurrection. Thank you. So I think uh, Janet has her hand up. Go ahead, Janet. You're muted, dear. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, uh, William, for catching us up on Seven Oaks and what's happening. It was, yeah, really quite something. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, I my my question is, I I came in, I needed to come in very late because I, um, at any rate. So I'm wondering, uh, you you've recorded this, and how would we get the recording? You might have mentioned that earlier, but I probably missed that. So my understanding is I will send this to Brian. I'm not sure how quickly it'll be up, but we have a YouTube, um, Mid-Atlantic Pathwork YouTube station. And I think that's where he edits and posts all of these um, videos. So um, I think he usually also, in, if you got the email, sends out that link to people and some other of the videos that are most recent there posted. So. Oh, excellent. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Malcolm. Um, the thing that comes up for me most in your presentation is that uh, when Lucifer got on his pulpit, he started preaching victimhood and everybody just latched on. <laughs> you know, all the fallen angels just latched on and followed him into victimhood. And uh, 
It's interesting that we have a presidential candidate who's preaching the same thing right now. And there's a lot of people latched on to his victimhood and what he's preaching about victimhood. And, uh, you know, it never stops. It never ends, it seems. <laughs> you know? You know, I think it has to intensify for us to see it more clearly somehow. <laughs> is my is my hope. <laughs> so I think, um, Malcolm, you were you had re your hand raised. Yeah, I I just I don't I don't I have this word that came throughout the lecture or the the, the talk you gave, and you didn't mention the word specifically, but. I don't know why it's just in my mind and that word is grace and um, something about the plan of salvation is, is filled with grace. I don't know how to talk about it other, in other way because I don't, I can't define grace really, but I just, that's what I felt. I think that is the definition of grace, the plan of salvation. <laughs> and, and yes, you know, I, I definitely, you know, relate to what you're saying, you know, the, the, the spirit of, you know, God has many divine aspects to his spirit and grace is one of them, right? You know, and the spirit of grace is very much present in that story. So thank you. And may we, you know, as we're going in through this weekend, you know, sort of hold on and, and recall that, bring that to heart and mind you know, as we go through our own journeys. Yeah, sure. When um, Frank just brought up about, about the victimhood, um, I definitely was, had a lot of victimhood and probably sometimes perpetrator energy throughout my life, but mostly I always thought of myself as a victim. And um, so I've sort of found that uh, when I look at the preacher of victimhood, currently I try to not judge it as much as I have compassion toward it mm -hmm. um you know to help heal it in myself because i don't need that kind of a leader because i can do it myself beautiful I can no i think it. go ahead sorry yeah yeah i really like that and i think you know even you know, in this doesn't say it specifically in the lecture, but, you know, sort of in this battle that Christ had, you know, it, the war, you know, with in the darkness, it had to be a, a war with and for love. I mean, it was a war of love. You know, it was like showing that love was more powerful than victimhood <laughs> in some sense or more powerful than, you know, like any wrong or any, you know, reaction to wrong that needed to, you know, be less than an attack. So, you know, there's this kind of, I think, real beauty when we can do the same, right? And try to, I think, I think the only way evil is transformed is through compassion. That's what Jesus is trying to teach us in his journey. And that is such a big thing to swallow, right? You know, like for all of us, that's the cutting edge of our, you know, development as Christed beings you know, to, to try to, you know, find that place whenever we can and to be, again, compassionate with ourselves and compassionate, you know, when we fall or when we, you know, we're not there, uh, sort of working with it in the aftermath because it is, I think, through the, you know, work inside of ourselves with the parts of ourselves that are in reaction, you know, and that work has to be done with compassion they will not be with us at all. <laughs> they won't hear us. They won't, you know, so if we, if we want to help them, you know, we have to come to them as a loving being, as the, as the Christ being, you know, to help. So thank you. Excellent. Excellent point.
Darlene, uh, this is Laurie. Thank you so much. It has been uh, such a long time since I've engaged with the Pathwork community and the lectures, and this was just perfect to have actually um, experienced this. And it's kind of opened up for me a way back in. And so I just want to thank you for your dedication over the years. Um, you've always just been there. So thank you so very much. Thank you. And and very glad that it, you know, touched you in, in a good way. So Welcome, Christine. We're just about winding down here. So this is being recorded and will be up on the YouTube channel in a while. I don't know if you dropped out and you were with us before or you're just coming in, but I um, just want to acknowledge that we're sort of winding up. Does anybody uh, else have... Uh, I, I just saw the emails. So uh -huh. I didn't know what time it was. And I, I know. I, I noticed that they didn't. I That was yeah. my fault. I thought Brian, I thought it was going to be Brian yeah. looking over things. But anyway, yeah. So yeah, yeah apologies. But it will apologies. be on the YouTube channel. So hopefully. Okay. You, you bet. Thanks. Yeah. So yes. And is there any last? And we can also go into an interaction, you know, time period if people would like as, as well. So I, you know, but is there anything more around the lecture that wants to be? spoken. Can you just remind us of the lecture numbers, 17, 18? 19, 20, 21, and 22. And I think 18 might be free will. I don't know. It's like, you know, there's free will, Christ, Jesus Christ, uh, creation, the fall, and the plan of salvation. So there's like a total of five. But the story actually begins, I think, with 19. And thank you, everybody, for, you know, coming. I, you know, really enjoyed doing this. It, I always like to connect with this myself. If anybody's in the area, we're doing a an Easter sunrise sweat lodge <laughs> at Earthwalkways. <laughs> and um, we'll probably revisit that the evening before or something. Um, for people there, I'll introduce some of these strange pathwork concepts to sweat lodge go <laughs> we'll do this syncretic thing <laughs> but um yeah i just really appreciated everybody you know coming and uh seeing everybody again so have a beautiful you know palm sunday and easter period now um and hopefully enjoy this beautiful spring it feels like it's a very very sweet delicious spring so where we can feel those vibrations you know to truly receive them as fully as possible is you know also feeding our souls and helping us through uh, these times of shaking and challenge so so i will <laughs> say goodbye to anybody that needs to leave and i will stay on anybody that wants to stay to hang out and chat a little yeah. bit chris i just want to say good luck with your surgery coming up I guess it's will happen between now and the next time we see you, right? Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yes, it it happens April the eighth is the yeah. date of surgery. Okay. So thank you. Yeah. I yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> really appreciate it. Goodbye. Thank everyone. you, Jane, for your comments. It's I just say I know it's not the biggest medical events that people have. <laughs> it feels pretty big to me. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Hip surgery? Yeah. That's big. Yeah. That's a big deal. Thank you. <laughs> and I don't know, even though the guide said, you know, Christ was, you know, the more suffering was in the spiritual and emotional and psychological. I find that physical suffering seems to be <laughs> to be the hardest there. one to bear. So <laughs> there's also a lot of psychological suffering that comes yeah. prior to that. Right, right. Well. That that feels like the bigger deal. <laughs> yeah. I I experienced That's huge fear. Big, totally helpless, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so I, this is Malcolm. I've been through the hip surgery, so I, I might know what you're headed for. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, and, thanks a lot. And, thank you. And here, here's the, this may be true for you or not, but 
the thought I came after I came through it, the one thought I had was, why did I wait so long? Oh. <laughs> that's yeah. good to hear. I hear many stories like that. I really that, that that's very uplifting. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, Frank. Bye. Bye. Well, thank you. I, I, let me put out too. I just realized, remembered. I think there's uh, June sixth uh, to eighth is going to be a weekend that we will actually be going back to Seven Oaks. If anybody feels, uh, you know, called to try to come, I'm sure they'll be putting something out about that. But um, we have rented the center from IMCW um, to reconnect there, just to let people know. And do you oh, still have your lecture? Not hearing you, Chris. Go ahead. Julie. Sorry, do you still have your lecture studies on Wednesdays or? Yeah, yeah. You want me to put you back on the list? Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll I'll try. Usually Wednesdays are, you know, I'm up early, so I'm not really lucid by <laughs> seven o'clock, but I, I always enjoy them. So that would be great. Yeah. Okay. And they're on your YouTube channel as well. If I Yes, they're posted on the YouTube channel as well. Great. Darlene Rollins. Thank yeah, you so much, Jordan. Yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted to, I just retired on Friday. Oh. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yes. Hey. Congratulations. <laughs> I've been feeling connect a lot, and that's why I'm glad I I, uh, I, I found this um, this event. And so I will be reaching out to get more involved with, because I've missed it a lot, and you know, so I think this is my chance to start again. Yay! What, 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 Malcolm? What are we retiring from? What, is, what was your? Uh, I was a systems analyst for Centera Healthcare. I formerly and and Virginia Premier. I supported the provider member portals for Virginia Premier. Um, basically technical analysts supporting the uh, databases and things like that for the last, gosh, 14 years, I think. That's what I'm wow. doing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations. Yes. Okay. Enjoy your retirement. <laughs> I'm, I'm really fortunate to have um, grandchildren and a daughter who sees my free time as a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to enjoy that. Great. And love to have any way you want to, you know, stay connected. Okay. I will. I'll be reaching out to you about that. So I have got to go. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Bye-bye, well, bye, everybody. Chris, I'll put it in my calendar and send some prayers on April 8th. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. I, I will as well, Chris. And I'll remember the date because I have, an appointment on that date as well. Darlene, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank yeah. you so yeah. much, Darlene. This was really profound and um, I'm still integrating it. So uh, thanks a lot for sharing it. You're welcome. Like most of the guides things, I always get something new every time I read it. You know, it really is amazing material. So yeah. All right. Bye, everybody. Yeah, Chris, I hope your surgery goes very well. I'm sure you'll be thank happy you. with a new hip. <laughs> thank too. you. I, I will. <laughs> thank you. And thanks thank for you so much. That was nice. Okay. I'll, I'm going to look up the YouTubes. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. And with the closing of Seven Oaks, the, these lectures and everything will still continue in some form. Yes, yes. The Pathwork, Mid-Atlantic Pathwork still continues. We have a YouTube session. There's still programs. Some of them are Zoom. We will probably eventually reinstitute, you know, more in-person stuff. Um, so, you know, there's still helpers active. So, you know. Oh, right. Um, and and the publishing um, books, are they, is that going anywhere or? As far as I know, you know, that so the lectures are all available online for free. And then I think they've turned over like the book sales, you know, they're I don't think the IPF is doing that per se anymore, but um, the lectures are available. There are some of the copies of the books that you can still order and or get them. I'm 
using a Kindle ebook from uh, on the original Pathwork of Transformation collection of lectures. So I, is that what you mean by it books? Just like that, yeah. And um, just some of the books too is a nice way to introduce other people to, to Pathwork. Yes. Yeah, they're uh, surrendering to the God within and yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, so they, I think, uh, I mean, I have some extra copies of that. If you can't get a copy, let me know. <laughs> but um <laughs> Because they're they're just kind of around like that, but you can get them on ebook on on Amazon now, I think, and so yeah. that also is another way to share them. Yeah, I try not to do Amazon, but anyway. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. I love today. Thank you very much. Yes. Bye -bye. Yes. Best of luck to you and your surgery. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you very bye much. Bye. Jane. Really, really lovely to be with you. Yes. Thank you, you for too. doing this. Yeah. Yes. Take Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.